My name is Chen Chen Zhang, a scientific editor at One Earth, a new flagship journal from Cell Press Publishing, high impact research that seeks to understand and address today's environmental and sustainability challenges. Um, I will be the moderator for this panel, which is about transforming trade and freight. International trade, like any economic activity, generates greenhouse gas emissions. Tracking and measuring gas emissions during the production and consumption of goods and services is, however, a complex tax because production often involves multiple inputs that may be carried out in different places. Growth in international trade has been characterized by globalization and the associated geographical fragmentation of international production processes. Supply chains have become longer and more complex as logistics networks link more and more economic centers across oceans and continents. Changing consumer preferences and new manufacturing requirements also affect international trade and thus shape freight patterns. This has led to more frequent smaller freight shipments and as a result to less for containers, more empty runs and increased demand for rapid energy intensive transport such as air freight. As tr freight transport, whether by air, land or sea, relies heavily on fossil fuels and is still a long way from being able to switch to cleaner energy sources, it is one of the hardest sector to decarbonize. The emissions during production, transport, and consumption along supply chains in and between countries are not negligible, from advancements in environmental and energy efficiency technologies to alternative clean fuels to policies, regulations, and governance. We have been making progress to decarbonize the trade sector, and continuous efforts have been made. But challenges remain in transforming the trade and transport sector to net zero. This is why we have this panel today, and let's explore the key gaps and opportunities of the net zero transition of trade and transport in the next two hours. We are very honored to have a very international group of experts join us today. Professor Dabo Guan, distinguished professor from Tsinghua University and also University College London, Professor Ki Hong Mai. Mike Lai, um, Chair Professor at the Hong Kong Polytechnical University, and Dr. Russell Thompson, Associate Professor at the University of Melbourne, and Professor Tsinghua Zhu, Distinguished Professor at Anti College of Economics and Management, Shanghai Delta University. We will begin with Dabo's keynote talk very soon. Dabo is the Distinguished Professor of Climate Change Economics at the Department of Earth System Science, Tsinghua University, Chair at the Bartlett School of Construction Project Management, University of College London. He's also a senior member at St. Edmund's College, University of Cambridge, and the Fellow of Academy of Social Sciences at United Kingdom. Let's welcome Dabo for his keynote talk. We will soon unmute ourselves and turn off our cameras while Dabo is talking. Dabo, the floor is yours. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Shen Shen's uh, introduction and the very nice uh, introduction about the, the topic. And uh, today, uh, myself, together with uh, other four uh, distinguished panelists, we are going to discuss about the relationship between um, fright and then trade and then possibly climate change uh, together. So uh, so I will uh, give uh, some kind of a background information. Uh, so some of my re uh, our recent research on the trade and the carbon neutrality topic, uh, then uh, we could uh, we could uh, discuss uh, how we could uh, uh, benefit uh, from from the uh, uh, the global trade, how we could uh, help. The, uh, to to uh, alleviate the climate change issues and uh, and hopefully achieve the uh, carbon neutrality by the middle of the century as the most of the country uh, promised it to do. Um, the firstly, I will just uh, quickly run through some of the uh, the 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 latest uh, research. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I'd like to introduce a a, a kind of a database. Uh, we produce uh, at Tsinghua and together with many colleagues around the world. Um, it's called the Carbon Emission Account and Datasets for Emerging Economies. Um, so it's a seeds. Uh, so if you are um, a, a researcher in the uh, the uh, climate change uh, field, you might heard of 
this uh, this uh, database already. Um, so we we set up this uh, CS database from 2016, and it's uh, freely available online. Uh, we provide the multi-scale copy emission, uh, uh, like uh, emission inventories for starting with China, national, provincial, and the city level. Uh, in recent few years, we expanding to not only including the uh, the data for uh, China, uh, also other emerging economies. It's mainly focused on the uh, the the developing countries. Uh, many of them are the least developed regions and countries. So the whole uh, the CIS database is provide a transparent, comparable verificable and a free kind of a database and you could assess our emission uh, all the, the data we published uh, uh, on the CIS website um, and then the most important we uh, we, we, we provide the multi skills multidisciplinary and then try to be robust and accurate in terms of regional and national emission accounts um, the one of the feature of the, the emission accounts is that it doesn't matter is the uh, national, regional, or city level, or even uh, you know uh, on this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, provincial, whatever the level, uh, with China or its other countries, they always have the same format uh, in terms of the uh, the emissions. It's always like this: is forty seven social economic sectors by 20 uh, different energy types. Um, it doesn't matter if it's China or it's Estonia or Mongolia or, or any other uh, countries, it's always the same. So in that case, uh, we could be able to make some comparable and then and a detailed uh, social economic uh, analysis uh, regarding to the, the uh, carbon neutrality or the carbon or any climate change uh, work so you can, you can do. Okay, so that was the, the the very brief introduction about the database. We will touch that a little bit further in a few minutes. But now I, I want to you know discuss why we want to study the climate change and why this is the climate change is very important. Um, we have the, the whole uh, panel group is the, the fifth group. So you might, many of you have heard the uh, previous uh, kind of the expert was talking about this. Um, we we'll just uh, revise this is very uh, uh, from trying to address this issue from our own the trade perspective on that. Um, so this you po you possibly have seen this graph um, you know several times, but this is really is the uh, talking about the in the historical emissions the whole human can at the global is increasing the emissions very quickly uh, since, uh, especially since 2000 until right now to 2020. And it has been a very fast emission growth. If we we keep the such like trajectories, the emissions will go along these red lines, which will actually will lead us to the globally by the end of the century to have a very high climate risk, will, which means the global temperature will rise from, uh, to five to seven degrees C is roughly. Um, but uh, what we have is trying to, uh, the globally, we are uh, trying to limit our emission, uh, kind of the temperature uh, rise under two degrees C. So in that case, we will need to uh, develop ourselves uh, along this blue and uh, or green lines in, in this one. This would give us, like say, um, you know, some kind of a, a below two degrees C uh, temperature rise, but this is, doesn't mean there's no uh, temperature, no kind of a climate risk in in the future. But it's the climate risk which the human can or the people can manage, and then rather than like to five to seven degrees, is the high climate risk is out of our control. So whatever that happens in the future, the climate risk will increase. We, will, we have seen so many um, uh, climate extreme uh, happens. We see hurricanes, we see floodings, uh, not only in China, but in many other places. Uh, that means that, that this would actually uh, will uh, intensify in the future. 
Um, so the climate risk is not means okay the temperature or the the weather is just gonna change, but it actually affects every corner of our lifestyles. So for example, if you like um, you know you know cons- you know if for for our consumptions for agricultural products, so this is uh, some basic statistics from the literature saying that the high climate risk would actually affect your consumptions. They would lead to about twenty percent of rice production. Uh, decline uh, to roughly about forty percent of if we rise our temperature five to seven degrees C, the uh, the soybeans will reduce forty percent, and uh, your coffee and the coke uh, uh, chocolate the consumptions uh, will all all uh, decline. Um, one of these studies we did um, uh, in the past uh, in twenty eighteen is trying to look at basic climate change will actually jeopardize your beer consumptions. This is, you know, the uh, we, you know, everywhere, you know, over every city is almost they prepare uh, like uh, they produce uh, beers, and um, but uh, because but the only the the barley, the the most uh, common kind of crop uh, of making beers is only produced in certain places in the world, and um, because if the climate change. Drought would be able to reduce the uh, the the bodies. They will they will actually the trade for the bodies to everywhere we become more expensive. Therefore, the beers will be more expensive. Then the uh, the pr- uh, the price will go up. So this really is gonna happen on our uh, you know every corner of what we we, we our consumption is. So, so this is the, the basic the background and why the climate change is very important to global trade and to our consumptions. But now this is a basically we'll talk about you know the people will ask okay well we t- we say so much but how much uh, emissions we could in- in- inject to the atmosphere and how much is left. So we talk about the two degrees C target. The, the black line is the the space or to do this target. So um, so from whatever we, we you know from roughly 1850s until now and uh, until the end of the next century uh, the, the coming centuries um, the this is the so much what we can dis- uh, discharge to the to the to the environment or to the to the atmosphere and uh, this is uh, how much damage already made unless we have some significant large scale of geoengineering projects, we may not be able to get it out. So really it's this much of the emissions. It's about 800 gigatons of CO2 emissions. In Chinese way, it's 8,000, um, like a tens on the power of 10, uh, eight of the tons of CO2 emissions. So 800 gigatons of the global emission space is remained. The next question is, we have this much of the emission remained, and how who will get what basically um i'm not gonna list uh, all 200 countries in the world here and how about this but we just look at the four major economies and then their past emissions and and then in their future emissions and whether we can think whether we we, we have the uh, the um, the uh, uh, like a limit in whether we have enough a space emission space for or for the country's development, so the um, if we look at the from twenty ten to twenty twenty, uh, EU you uh, United States their emissions gradually you know, like a, a de- decline but not not very significantly uh, not very fast. China has been stabilized their emissions since um, like 2013, 2014. India has grown their emission quite significantly over the last 10 years or so. And then the other countries, especially in Africa and the South Asian countries, their emission has risen very quickly over the last 10 years or so. The four major economies, they all have uh, promised uh, kind of uh, committed the carbon neutrality goals by around middle of century. Uh, UK, uh, EU, US, they will say 2050, China 2060, uh, Indian uh, promised to do it in 2070s. So this is uh, really in is if we we talk about the uh, carbon neutralities, then this is what we need. The much space uh, emission space we will have, and then uh, there's other countries, the black uh, the blank. 
areas is uh, what we left for the other countries. So, you know, we may have enough, or this is your own judgment, to, to see um, whether this is enough to, to have it. But if, a, uh, if it's not enough, and what do we need to do on this? Um, a little bit about the uh, the the rationale of emission peaks and neutralities. Um, so this is uh, the uh, graph, like a hypothetical kind of a graph. We we trying to see the relationship between uh, emissions and then and uh, social economic development. So the firstly, they always fossil fuel consumptions and together with the uh, emission growth, uh, 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 together with the economic. Uh, development. Then, when the, any country or economy reach a certain period, it will become a platform period, uh, and eventually reach a emission peak. Then, the, after the emission peak, the uh, the uh, the the emission will rapidly go down. But we always keep the social economic development, either measured by GDP, wealth, or any or happiness, uh, will say the go up uh, uh, like a sustainability. And then trying to compare the some uh, figures between EU, China, and the uh, and the US to see the emission targets and the effort they made. Um, so uh, EU has reached the emission peak roughly around 1980s. Uh, US reached emission peak roughly 2005, and they all promised to deliver the carbon neutrality goals by 2050s. So in that case, EU have roughly about 70 years. U.S. is about 45, more, more than 45 years to deliver the, the carbon neutrality goals. China will peak their emissions, promise to peak the emission by 2030, will uh, net neutrality by the 2060s. So they have uh, roughly about 30 years to do it. And so, and then, so that means China would have only half of the time uh, period uh, to reduce the emissions of twice of the emission volume to Europe 28. So this is really, really um, is a uh, like a challenge and it's gonna uh, trigger a, a, a sort of revolutionary kind of transitions for Chinese social economic um, kind of uh, transitions. Um, there's some, um, oh, actually, this is a little bit out of date. It's about 100, um, I think 136 of countries has already committed uh, the carbon neutrality goals in the world. And uh, this uh, actually um, uh, covers more than 75% of there's GDP and carbon emissions and over 60% of the populations. So the uh, carbon neutrality is really is going to be the next um, like in the next few decades is going to be the key uh, common topic for the whole human kind. Um, but the 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 emission uh, emission accounts is uh, especially for global South countries and especially for those uh, uh, like a, um, like a less developed regions is not um, uh, like paid much attention. Um, so uh, especially for the, the data many of the, the countries this data is not even available um starting about three four years ago we started to compile the 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 global emission uh, the emission inventories for global emerging economies uh trying to aiming to to complete or to uh, to provide the complete database for like uh, countries like Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, uh, Nepal, Bos uh, Botswana, Sri Lanka, Uganda, those kind of countries who usually doesn't have a sufficient kind of uh, uh, statistical um, kind of uh, um, systems, and then we try to build the emission accounts for them. Um, last year, uh, to, uh, like uh, October, uh, also in November, uh, in the COP 16s, we actually launched the first uh, annual report for the carbon emission accounts for global uh, emerging economies. And that's actually the first uh, report is covered by 30 uh, emerging economies. It doesn't include in China. China will publish it separately. So if you're interested, and then you can go online, the seas.net, and then there's the, uh, the report can be downloaded for free. And uh, yeah, this cover the first they cover the many uh, South Asian and uh, Central China, uh, Asia and uh, uh, Amer uh, like uh, South American countries, 30 countries. And a lot of them, uh, roughly half of them, we are able to um, you know, provide the regional emission accounts, for example, 33 Indian states 
and uh, then uh, for Russia, it's 83, uh, 83 rational, uh, Russian kind of uh, federal states, um, and then uh, to break and, uh, them into the regional uh, space. So you could uh, be able to find the emission account for that. Um, so, um, so all this um, uh, kind of the 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 analysis or the the data we provided here is from the production base, which is a, uh, like a, how much emissions is from their territories, how much is from the productions. But actually, uh, there's a different another way to look at the emissions account. Uh, it's called consumption base account. So I give a, a comparisons for this. Uh, uh, this two approach is actually two sides of the same coin. The, that's, it's a quite easy to understand. If we look at the toy production and consumption, you would understand what it means for the emissions. And the globally, um, the global toy production is uh, centralized in, um, in Asia, basically, uh, especially the Far East and the Southeast Asia, but the consumption is actually concentrated in the in the uh, the western part of the world in Europe and in, uh, in the US. So this is the the two different ways to look at this. Um, so one day when we talk about the toy sectors of, of emission reductions, and uh, there's a question now on whose respons whose responsibility. Is it responsibility for for China, India, and other uh, Sri Lanka? Uh, they're producing the uh, the the dolls, the Barbie dolls, or is the 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 Western countries uh, who consume or bought most of the dolls? And who's responsibility for that? So this graph actually shows you. Um, the uh, the the emission productions, uh, so global emissions uh, on the left hand side is from production side, uh, and then the right hand side is a consumption uh, approach. Uh, how this emission flows from productions to consumptions. If we break kind of the uh, the global emission by ten diff or, or different uh, production sectors. Um, the yellow part on the left hand side is global electricity uh, productions. So from production perspective, electricity will take roughly about half of the emissions. So producing electricity is half of the emissions from the production uh, approach. But from the consumption side, electricity is a, just an intermediate product. They are not, you know, for the final use for electricity is quite minimal. Uh, for daily people's use, like we're charging our phones, we're using our computers, that's pretty much. But most of the electricity will be used for per processed aluminiums, uh, using for support uh, like uh, steels or other heavy uh, industries too. For the, they are used as intermediate goods. And uh, down to the consumption side, and the construction sector, it will become the largest sector in terms of consumption uh, approach. If you look at the supply chain for the uh, construction sectors, you know, to fulfill our construction activities, we will need steel, uh, cement, glass, bricks, or any of those things. And producing all those kind of um, products is very carbon intensive. So it's a two different ways that they give you a completely different uh, aspect look look at look at the emissions, and in the middle we we have the supply chains, and in the middle we have all the global uh, uh, kind of uh, enterprises or all the uh, the 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 countries or the, the 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 all the firms are in the middle. We're gonna talk about it in a few minutes. But firstly, to look at the country level, so this uh, this figure is um, um, in the um, the IPCC AR five. So it's uh, like seven years ago uh, when we firstly produced the, uh, the the such uh, like emission flows between countries. So back in 20, uh, 2004, globally, if we uh, like a category all the uh, countries into ten uh, world regions uh, among the East Asia. Mostly China plus some of other 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 countries there. Roughly, their one third of their emissions were uh, was for producing export productions, and then you know, for export. So it's um, you know roughly about one third of Chinese emissions is actually for producing export uh, goods and commodities. Um, so 
roughly about one third of the Chinese、um, kind of、uh, export goods is go to America and Canada, and about another one third go to Western European countries. And some、uh, about twenty percent goes to、uh, like kind of Japan, Australia. So at that time, the、uh, the、uh, the developed countries will consume about sixty percent of embodied emission in Chinese trade, basically.、Um, If we look at the 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 the, the, the a little bit longer uh, period uh, from two thousand four to twenty eleven, the、um, the Chinese emissions、uh, embodied emission trade is grow about fifty percent, but largely triggered by China's trade with India, with uh, with uh, with um, um, like、um, uh, Middle Eastern Africa, uh, with uh, also the、um, uh, Latin American countries. On the same time, Indian's emissions. Embodied emission in China, Indians export grow about ninety five percent. It's almost doubled. It's also、uh, triggered by Indians trade with China, Indian trade with、uh, Africa, Latin American countries. So、um, gradually,、uh, trade between South 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 trading will become a very、uh, you know become a one of the important and very fast drivers. Fast. Uh, kind of、uh, growth drivers for global emissions, and then and the,、um, for large、uh, economies for China,、uh, the data was you know gradually improved. Indian is gradually catching up. Many other country doesn't, and many of the countries we don't have the 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 the, the trade data or the emissions embodied in trade data,、um, because of that. Building upon this、uh, emission kind of、um, um, build, e- emission database, we have we actually、uh, developed、uh, a kind of a full scale, which is included every economy in the world,、uh, a global trade database on this.、Um, uh, it, it, it's actually、uh, done and is about to. It、should be any day. It's gonna be online、uh, now. So we 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 got this uh, published uh, in the journal already, and then and then this should be coming out released、uh, any day now. So this、uh, we call the emerging model, and we we this is covers two hundred forty five economies,、uh, both、uh, like nationals, including every like even the Pacific Islands or any countries. Uh, who have、uh, trading activities, and then mod, mod,、uh, kind of、uh, by a hundred thirty-five sectors for each economy we have. So this is including every economy in the world, and、uh, to have the、uh, the the trade. Especially, we pay a lot of attention about the the trade quality,、uh, data qualities, and then the 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 comprehensive. Uh, coverage for all developing countries.、Um, so, so in that case, we are able to mapping the the uh, the uh, the、uh, the global trade activities and、uh, how they they their kind of or、uh, uh, what will be associated、uh, carbon consequence or any other environment consequence because of the the trade. So, this is the first time we put developing countries in the center of the、uh, the study. And then trying to look at the south south emission growth on that. So as a result, we we actually produce this uh, data uh, database uh, on an annual basis. And、uh, the the first released region uh, uh, first released version for the model is from two thousand five to twenty、uh, nineteen. And we we select a few years to make some some comparisons. In the twenty nineteen. Um, so all the countries、um, included、uh, on the left hand side, this、uh, figures shows、um, in 2019 the top 10 embodied emission flows in the world,、uh, even until now, from the absolute magnitude of the trade volume or the emissions trade volumes,、uh, China to US and China to EU, China to Japan. Is still among the largest emission、uh, embodied emission flow kind of、uh, to that, but we from the left hand side there's four figures we could、uh, really see. This is a、uh, on the four figures on the right hand side is to class to to really highlight the trade volumes be the top ten trade volumes between South South trade. Uh, global South countries, so we can see this.、Uh, those arrows 
uh, from 2004 to 2017, uh, thick, getting thicker and thicker uh, in the, um, um, uh, you know, along the, 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 the time increase. So there's no doubt in the future, the Global South will be, uh, uh, it's playing a, a very important role in climate change mitigations, and especially for global trade, how can a sustainable trade can be can be done? How the, the carbon neutrality oriented trade can be can be done on this? Um, so this is a very uh, macro level. Let's look at a little the middle, uh, like the lower kind of in terms of the enterprises. Uh, look at the supply chains. So we, uh, you know, everyone using the phone. Uh, still until today, the majority of the phones are made in China, even uh, like the iPhone, whatever the phone you're using. Uh, I think from to, to iPhone 12 or iPhone 11, it doesn't have such a label, but before iPhone 11, they always have the label says, designed in Apple in, uh, by Apple in California, assembled in China. And then from iPhone kind of 12 or 11 or above, it doesn't have such a, um, like a character anymore. I'm not, not sure, I haven't figured out why, but, uh, but uh, everyone knows that the majority of the, the, uh, the, 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 the components productions and the final assembly is in China. Most of the iPhones are here. Um, but um, the, 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 the cost kind of the, the, the overall supply chain cost for, for the producer iPhone. I know the iPhone 10 was about uh, 178 US dollars per set of the iPhone. China producer for all those things only make $4 per set. $130 go back to design, you know, go back to the iPhone, Apple company in California. And the rest is uh, distributed between Japan, um, you know, all or kind of Korea and many other places. So this is actually classify the uh, the supply chain positions of all countries by producing an iPhone, which is in any countries in the US or in China is all classified a high uh, value added electronic production sectors, but they complete in a different uh, position in the global supply chain. And then the uh, China will take the most carbon intensive uh, part of the supply chain uh, versus California would actually uh, take the high, really high value added or the cleaner part of the supply chain. Um, and there's some, um, one we, you know, classify there's the multinational companies associated on, on this. Uh, it doesn't matter it's about US, EU, and then China, they all have the global uh, multinational companies. They are they are they they, they actually um, um, kind of responsible for most of the foreign direct investments in all the countries. Um, one of the papers we published last year or maybe two years ago was about the volume of the carbon footprint for the, those multinational companies. Um, uh, by uh, the, the, you know the, as a whole, the global the multinational. Uh, companies, they actually uh, take roughly about 20% of the global emissions already. Just a few of the uh, large uh, uh, multinational companies, they take over about 20% of global emissions. And then they, and especially they, they, uh, they gradually investing to the developing countries and they will actually trigger their emission go up from uh, mid of a 2000 to roughly uh, uh, roughly around 2010 uh, in recent a few years the emissions uh, you know declined a little bit because uh, because of the energy shift in uh, in developing countries also they're trying to starting to uh, develop uh, like invest a more green or high value added sectors on that this is a uh, give us some sort of um um, a decomposition analysis is about how their all the uh, multinational companies the, their uh, their emissions embodied in their supply chains and then in which factors would uh, affect the most. Basically, um, at the beginning from two thousand five to twenty ten, so the uh, the intensity which is the technology uh, kind of um, uh, improvement efficiency production efficiency improvements are the one of the the uh, offsetting factors and the skill effects, which is means there are lots of uh, FDIs or the foreign 
uh, kind of uh, kind of the investment uh, by this uh, uh, MEs to developing countries is driving on this. From 2011 to 2016, the the whole emissions are going down a little bit. Again, it's driven by the efficiencies and also the the uh, energy uh, patterns, uh, cleaner energy transitions uh, to in China and then some of the other developing countries. Um, so the, um, the above is, is about the overall um, kind of uh, uh, multinational companies. But we now we want to look at the the each individual giant, like the multinational giant, uh, large giants like a Coca Cola. Shell, BP, or whatever, um, like uh, Volkswagen, uh, themselves are pretty much like their emissions in, in their supply chain is almost like a, a country already. For example, Coca Cola is um, uh, the, 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 their supply chain emissions is pretty much uh, in, uh, is equal to the China's overall uh, emissions in uh, food sectors. Which is owned by uh, the like uh, the food sector owned by the foreign foreign uh, the entire foreign uh, companies already. So this is a very large. Um, so the, each of these um, uh, sectors globally, uh, it doesn't matter it's in China, in India, Mexico, uh, only a, a handful of uh, top companies are uh, they owning those things. Like I mentioned, a beer. There's a bit millions of brand in beers, but uh, you know the beers in you know, each country, so each uh, places have a, have your own local brand. But if you, you possibly never knows, ninety percent of global beer productions, it doesn't matter which brand is, is owned by three top kind of um, um, uh, like a, a beer companies anyway. Um, so uh, um, so it's, it's, it's a, so it's a large companies, the multinational enterprise, they have a power to, uh, to, uh, to push the, 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 the supply chains. So this is, we, we actually um, starting to look at more uh, comprehensive kind of the um, uh, enterprises to look at the large enterprises in each supply chain, uh, each sectors and how their emissions would uh, actually uh, do. And especially uh, about their, I think we just uh, jump to, to this one. So we actually classify their emission from the upstream up a supply chain and the downstream sub supply chain by looking at the Nastos, uh, ExxonMobil, Toyota, or Intel, or all, all different kind of sectors, uh, their emissions is, I mean, each different like a uh, multinational enterprises emissions, but their supply chains upstream and their supply chain downstream. We can see that Nasto in the middle of uh, that, they have a very high um, kind of um, uh, upstream uh, emissions. Uh, there's uh, their suppliers. Uh, Nasso is the largest uh, food uh, multinational companies in the world, and uh, they can actually push. Kind of if they have some local like ESG, where we talk about all these uh, low carbon uh, carbon neutrality strategies, and uh, they could even more effective to push the supply chain would go green. Similarly, Toyota or like um, Shell or uh, Actual Mobile, they would have a uh, like a downstream to their cu uh, customers. Uh, then if they push it down, then they could be able to uh, help to clean the, the supply chain more effectively. So I think I, I, I will just, um, I think I will just uh, consume the time already. But then mainly, I think what I'm trying to do that uh, say is that um, climate change is everybody's responsibility. It's every government's responsibility. Uh, very importantly, uh, supply uh, like uh, uh, pl players in the middle of the supply chains, like uh, multinational enterprises or the business, they should cooperate together, and then they should uh, work with the upstream suppliers and downstream downstream customers to achieve, um, uh, 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 to push the whole supply chain uh, to uh, carbon neutrality development or transitions. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, I'm, I'm welcome the comments from everyone, especially looking forward to the, uh, the, the works and the comments from other panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dabo, for this very interesting keynote talk, which I feel presents a quite broad, broadly accessible, comprehensive picture of the complex mechanisms behind economies and trade. 
and which I believe sets a really nice and useful thing for the rest of this panel. So next, let's welcome our panelists. All uh, let's all uh, turn to our cameras, and um, I will also introduce you each. And you each will have about ten minutes or. Uh, more as, as you see appropriate to introduce yourself and your research in the context of, of this panel. Uh, maybe we will start from Professor uh, Mike Lai from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Welcome, Mike, on board. Okay, uh, thank you, Sun Sun. Uh, uh, thanks uh, a lot uh, for the self pressure to uh, organize uh, this uh, meaningful event. So I'm uh, Mike Lai. Uh, I'm uh, from the Hong Kong Polytechnic Universities. My research area is mainly on the uh, shipping and logistic uh, management. So uh, my sharing uh, today is uh, on the uh, shipping and logistic uh, perspective. Uh, 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 I would like to uh, share with you uh, some screen about the uh, uh, sharing. So uh, logistics uh, industry is uh, the data sectors uh, for the uh, 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 carbon emissions. Uh, most of the study are uh, mainly conduct on the uh, manufacturing size uh, in the published journals, but a lot much has been done about the uh, cost by the logistic industry in uh, the uh, uh, carbon emissions. So uh, uh, we, kn we know that uh, China is a, a major uh, uh, a contributor for the C CO2 emissions. And, uh, and, and you see uh, in this uh, diagram that uh, the emissions uh, contributed by China is uh, increasing uh, in uh, recent years. And the logistic sector is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, major contributor to the uh, uh, CO2 e emissions, and also uh, the uh, emission is also uh, on the uh, increasing uh, trend uh, due to the uh, uh, global uh, scale and the scope of the operations of the logistic sector. So uh, the uh, activities uh, by the logistic service providers uh, in contributing to the carbon emissions should not be neglected. And uh, um, uh, so far, a uh, lot much has been done about the uh, uh, situations about the uh, logistic sectors uh, in uh, uh, employing about the uh, green practices in the operations. So what I would like to share uh, in my sharing is about my, my, my some of my, my views about the logistic industries uh, in the uh, decarbonization process. So uh, we have been seeing that a uh, lot of uh, policy interventions have been uh, uh, seen uh, in the logistic sectors. Uh, uh, pressurizing uh, the uh, industry player to uh, implement some of the uh, green practices to improve their uh, environmental uh, uh, operations. So uh, we have been seeing a uh, lot of uh, policy in, uh, interventions uh, in recent years. For example, uh, in uh, 2015, uh, uh, we have seen in, uh, in China, so there will be uh, some uh, 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 long-term development plan for logistic standardizations. And we have seen some uh, Green logistic indicators and green packagings in Hong Kong. So uh, we have also signed the Guangdong Hong Kong uh, Cleaner Production uh, Corporate uh, Agreement. The the major changes we have seen is in the uh, 2017. So uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, what we call the big ban for the uh, uh, policy interventions uh, for the uh, logistics sectors to go uh, greener in the operations. Uh, in this 2017, uh, we have seen uh, in China. So there was a 13 five-year plan, uh, which uh, required the uh, 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 more uh, 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 comprehensive uh, transportation, transportation system development for greening. Uh, uh, for example, uh, we see the uh, green traffic uh, equipment project. Uh, we have also seen uh, that uh, there will be a more uh, 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 efficient, uh, efficient of the fleet and also, we also see that uh, in, in, in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, so there are many agreements for, for greening. Uh, so in the subsequent year, uh, 2018 to 2020, we have also seen uh, more and more uh, 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 green practices in the industry. So uh, even uh, that, uh, we have seen many uh, regulatory requirements for greening for the logistics industry. But uh, in the literature, we have not seen much of the study about what has been done uh, in the logistics industries for greening and 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 particularly, so uh, uh, what are the occurrence? What are the uh, practices that they are currently implementing to go greener in the operations? And also, what are the uh, characteristics of the logistics industries uh, uh, in their green efforts? Uh, uh, under this background, uh, I, I would like to find out about the uh, the occurrence, the characteristics. The extent and also the 
performance value of the logistic industry in China, uh, what they are doing uh, in the green uh, 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 practices for uh, environmental protections. Uh, I would like to also suggest a pathway for the uh, green transitions for the logistics service provider uh, in China. So uh, 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 I try to uh, find out first of all uh, what uh, are the occurrence of the green practice in the logistic uh, industry in China. I uh, uh, start to uh, search some uh, public, publicly listed logistics service providers in China to look at about their uh, uh, corporate report to see uh, what are their uh, practices as reported uh, in their uh, uh, annual report and then uh, to do some analysis. So uh, we uh, 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 identify uh, uh, 37 uh, logistics service provider uh, 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 listed in the uh, stock market and we also uh, co collect uh, their uh, corporate report to, to, to find out uh, uh, what are their environmental management practices report in their annual reports. And uh, we uh, uh, analyze about the, 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 the text to, to see what they are doing. And uh, uh, based on about their textual analysis, uh, we find out uh, about their uh, uh, different types of green practices and uh, we conduct the uh, uh, so-called uh, topic analysis. And then uh, in, the, in the results, we find that uh, there are four uh, 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 different topics as implemented by the logistics service provider in China. Uh, 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 these are include about the uh, uh, green foundation. These are the, the basic uh, 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 green practices in the operations. The second type is about the green trucking, about in the road transport. The third is about uh, on the green shipping, more on the maritime transport. And the last one is about the green operations. So the scope of our study cover uh, the, the, the several stock market in China, as it includes about the uh, uh, Shanghai uh, 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 Stock Exchange, Shenzhen Stock Exchange, uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, and also the Taiwan. Uh, so uh, we, 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 we collect uh, the, the reports from all the uh, logistics service providers listed in all the uh, stock market to understand better about what is happening for the green practices in the uh, logistics industry in China. So uh, uh, about the uh, occurrence, so we find that uh, so uh, 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 many of them uh, have the uh, some basic uh, uh, green practice in, 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 in the operations. Uh, in the annual report, we find some of the uh, 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 key works are uh, in the report. They say about the compliance with legislations and standards, environmental performance measurements and assessments, and staff education about uh, environmental operations. So this seems that so these are the basic practices they are responding to the uh, regulatory uh, requirements uh, for the greening. And for the other three topics, uh, uh, one is about the uh, uh, green trucking or road transport. We find some keywords about the uh, new energy and vehicles and packaging. And also in the aviation uh, aspect, uh, we find that uh, they are, are, are applying some of the logistic optimizations uh, 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 practices. And in the uh, uh, maritime shipping aspect, so uh, they are uh, uh, making some of the uh, 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 compliance with the legislations. So overall, so uh, we have seen uh, in the report that uh, they apply uh, 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 some of the uh, less uh, uh, investment intensive methods to go greening. For example, they have some uh, logistic optimization practices uh, in the operation, for example, to uh, a better schedule about the, 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 uh, the transportation uh, 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 routing and also about the, 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 the uh, shipment schedules. And, uh, and uh, we also find that uh, for the characteristics of their uh, green practices, uh, 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 we find many of the works are, are about the uh, uh, compliance with the legislations. So uh, 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 my initial conclusion is that so, uh, the logistics industries are, are very uh, 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 concerned about the greening, particularly uh, due to the uh, uh, regulatory pressures uh, to go greening. And, and in our analysis, we, we, we analyze uh, 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 the reports in several years, and we see that uh, these keywords are also uh, constantly uh, uh, changing. And the, the most uh, drastic changes was observed in the 2017,000, uh, uh, where uh, we have sent 
uh, seen about the big bands that uh, particularly in China, there's a, a 15, a 13 years, five, 13 five year plans uh, uh, mandating the uh, logistics uh, service provider to go greener. And also uh, in recent year, we also seen that uh, they are also uh, 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 start to uh, 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 employ more uh, 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 technology uh, to enable the, the greening in their processes. And uh, in, our, uh, in our study, uh, we slide that uh, uh, the logistics service provider are also in the uh, uh, process are facing a lot of uncertainty, particularly. So there are different types of uh, technologies that they are re uh, uh, utilizing uh, for the uh, decol decarbonization journeys. But uh, they are facing a lot of uncertainty, particularly about the, the, the different options and also, uh, uh, and also about the uh, evolutions of the different uh, technologies uh, that are, are applicable for their uh, greening. So uh, in, in our study, uh, we uh, identified the uh, 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 three-state pa pathway uh, of the green transitions, uh, transitions for logistics service provider in China. So uh, 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 we find that uh, uh, most of the logistics service provider are currently are paid, uh, basically uh, uh, doing uh, uh, a lot much uh, in the uh, uh, green, greening, particularly uh, their main intention is to respond to the regulatory pressures. So uh, many of them are just uh, doing about the very basic uh, green foundations, for example, just to do the minimum to uh, meet the regulatory requirements to achieve the green baseline uh, in this stage. Uh, this is the, the, the current status in, in the uh, uh, logistics industries. And uh, uh, when they uh, 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 evolve uh, in their uh, uh, green journey, so uh, the next step uh, may be uh, they uh, need to have uh, uh, identify some of the profitable practices, particularly in the logistics industries. Uh, there are many small and medium enterprises. So uh, they may be lacking about the little financial resources or the, the knowledge to invest in the uh, practice uh, uh, good for the environment. So in, such, in that case, so uh, uh, in order to uh, promote about the greening in the industry, so uh, they may need to start with uh, some of the practices that may not involve uh, lots of investment, but they can help them to, for example, improve the optimizations of the process or to improve the performance. And also uh, uh, for the some large uh, uh, logistics service providers, uh, they are starting to uh, uh, develop some of the digital platforms uh, to lead the development of the uh, 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 greening uh, in the operations. So they may have their digitalization, visualization of the process to, 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 to use less resources to perform more uh, cargo delivery. So uh, the third stage uh, is about the uh, pilot uh, project of cleaner and uh, also new technologies. Uh, this may not be easy for the SME. Uh, this is the major problem for the logistics industry because uh, while we see that are many uh, big company in the market, but the composition of the logistics industry uh, uh, around the world are mainly uh, 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 composed by many of the SME, particularly many smaller fire forwarders. Uh, they may not have the uh, 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 needed resources to uh, invest uh, in the uh, cleaner and newer energies. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, the large uh, uh, LSP, uh, logistics service provider may take the lead uh, to, 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 to guide the process and also to uh, 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 help the uh, smaller uh, uh, providers uh, to uh, make a greener operations. Uh, uh, in the process. Uh, this is uh, what I would like to share uh, in the panel. And I would like to uh, hear uh, some of the uh, comments uh, from the panels uh, about the uh, sharing of my part. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike, for, for your introduction and illustration of this very interesting topic about green logistics. I believe we will touch upon a lot um, during our panel discussion later on. So. Uh, I will move on to the next. Um, welcome on board, Dr. Russell Thompson from the University of Melbourne. And I will just relay the microphone to you. Thank you. Um, I'll just um, share my screen and... Okay, well... 
Good morning, good afternoon. Um, and I'm Russell Thompson from University of Melbourne, and it's my pleasure to um, to look at. Um, can everyone see my? Yes. Is it? Um, uh, so is, is that is that better? Yes. Thanks. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm Russell Thompson from USC Melbourne. It's my pleasure to, to introduce some com concepts that I've been researching for some time, which uh, relates to trying to uh, look at urban freight, urban logistics, and, um, and look at the trends in that area and the challenges. Um, so first of all, we, we work a lot with the city logistics, which um, is a new approach to integrated uh, planning and management of urban freight systems, which looks at the, the, the total cost, the, um, the total costs of um, our services and, um, and looks at environment, economic and social costs. Um, and it tries to look at all of these. And obviously environmental costs uh, have lots of emission um, related uh, impacts. And this study, which was conducted some time ago, um, a European study um, and that I participated in was uh, basically um, recommended that consolidation is the key to achieving, achieving sustainable urban transport, uh, goods transport. So um, consolidation of, of, of loads within vehicles. Uh, and this is a big challenge in, in around metropolitan areas and urban areas. So, um, and, uh, and of course, innovation as well. But um, consolidation is what we're focusing on uh, more today. And um, um, more recently, um, the, um, the, the International Transport Forum has identified that the network performance. So I look a lot at networks, look a lot at the way freight moves, the patterns of these, the vehicles, and, and the demand. And basically, um, we're trying to look for efficiency measures and um, really trying to focus on how we can improve vehicle loading. A lot of vehicles move around with very limited of their, of their capacity being utilised in terms of their capacity for, 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 for load in terms of area and weight. Um, and, and so overall, we try and look at measures which can try and help us understand uh, network performance from an efficiency and a sustainability perspective. And this um, the, uh, vehicle efficiency, um, network efficiency um, concept is to try and look at the tonne kilometre moved by the vehicle kilometre ratio. So that is that the tonne kilometres that the goods move a distance and weight, um, but we need to also look at how far and, and how far the vehicles are travelling that are carrying those goods. And this focuses again on the vehicles themselves in terms of their loads, in terms of the available capacity within the vehicles, and to try and increase that, that utilisation of that capacity, um, whether it be weight, volume or, or area. And um, so we're basically looking at trying to reduce the kilometres driven by the vehicles to deliver the same amount of goods within and around our metropolitan regions. And so um, the physical internet is a new concept, uh, which is getting a lot of uh, credibility, a lot of interest around the world. And this is the way we try and transform our independent networks, um, which are un uncoordinated, unintegrated, um, and um, try and look at how we can integrate these um, to increase um, the efficiency and sustainability. And so we're basically trying to encourage more openness and sharing of networks uh, through standardization and, 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 and modular uh, load units and vehicles, and to actually introduce more transparency within the networks as well. So um, we know where our goods are and we know um, we can track and trace these. And this involves a whole new concept of, in particularly in urban transport for um, distributors, for transport companies, uh, for individual companies to be able to share their assets uh, to get this uh, increased level of sustainability. The features of the PI, the physical internet systems, is that we're trying to introduce lots of compatibility and coordination, which involves having common co load units and compatible load units and, um, and when we change modes. The inherent um, aspect here is that um, where one truck might cross town for one load, um, and this might be the appropriate vehicle. We need to think about how we can transform this into a network of multi-mode and multi-vehicles um, and get higher load factors and introduce schemes where different modes can be used at different points in different parts of the city. This could be electric vehicles, bikes or trolleys. So many combinations, many different types of vehicles available today, some with uh, zero emissions, some with very little emissions, we should be trying to utilise those as much as possible. But because of their differences in range and efficiency um, and speed, um, they basically, uh, they have to be a network um, of these types of vehicles. And we have to design these for different loads, for different types of freight movement, 
uh, and to, to coordinate these vehicles. And we have to also design where transshipment facilities should be uh, placed and how big they should be. So this involves multimodal routing, routing and scheduling. So this involves trying to coordinate modes at different terminals and integrate the different loads being carried by vehicles and how this uh, operates within a city. And this involves a lot more integration than what is happening at the moment. We use a different, uh, it's a different range of vehicles, different types of vehicles. Uh, we have to coordinate the transfers at loading docks and, 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 and we have to also look at the different ways that the goods are more efficient in inner high density areas uh, such as walkers and the drivers need to um, be integrated into this as well. Um, and so diagrammatically, we have urban areas, large urban areas with gateways, maybe airports or, 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 um, or shipping ports. Uh, we also have lots of um, opportunities to exchange goods with rail, uh, with uh, different uh, nodes within our metropolitan areas. And within those smaller areas, we can have different vehicle types such as electric vehicles, and we can have larger vehicles transporting within the regions within our metropolitan region. And we can have high capacity vehicles doing some the bulk freight movements from our terminals uh, into um, our transfer centres. So this introduces lots of different um, types of facilities for transferring and to coordinate the different types of vehicles that are needed to get that efficiency and less vehicle movement uh, with less emissions. To illustrate this, I'll look at a distribution network in Melbourne, which we studied, which had about 48 um, different types of um, retail outlets. And uh, suppliers within the metropolitan region were servicing these from um, some, some of their warehousing areas. And they're developing some most efficient routes um, that every day they would undertake uh, a, a, a certain route uh, to deliver within a certain region of the Melbourne metropolitan area. So for example, here in, in, in an area called Brayside, then uh, lots of different um, movements are possible from that facility to the retailers. And they're quite efficient in their own way. Um, but we know that there's lots of different supplies into these retail outlets. There's some in, in other parts of the city, such as Dandenong, Scoresby uh, and Somerton. And so they all can develop their own individual efficient networks. Um, but, and, um, but you can see that um, uh, this is a big challenge uh, when we're trying to introduce uh, this around different um, but then we can introduce a more uh, complex sharing type arrangement where we can rationalise the movements and we can actually swap goods and we can transfer goods at a central uh, facility, uh, whether this be Scoresby, and we can do shuttles between these, um, these warehouses and share warehouse space. And then we can develop far more efficient and shorter routes in the vicinity of these warehouses. And so this introduces a two-tier type of distribution network where uh, local routing can be done more efficiently with less distance traveled and initially a swap of goods occurs uh, between these different suppliers into these retail facilities. And you can see the reduction that is possible in terms of total distance travel, quite dramatic, nearly 78% uh, uh, reduction in the distance traveled by vehicles uh, with this two tiered shared collaborative network. So this is a major improvement in terms of total distance. Therefore, with using traditional vehicles, total emission savings within a distribution network with this case study here in Melbourne. So to introduce another type of scheme where we could introduce some collaboration, some sharing, uh, commonly uh, that uh, couriers uh, pick up um, in, in the mornings uh, within the metropolitan region and bring their, 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 their goods and, and parcels to depots. And so this one represents a typical movement pattern uh, and then deliver these in the afternoon, for example, into a central city area. So this is typical by an independent operator um, to, to, to actually have a network with a number of pickups and then uh, in, in the inner city drop offs in, in the afternoon. And we can assume that there's many different types of couriers and uh, numbers of, and they have very similar networks where they have uh, distance and customers scattered right around the metropolitan wider region and to deliver these in the inner city areas. So um, just to illustrate hypothetically, uh, the sort of networks which are common in our cities uh, with uh, multiple depots, but independent depots running their own uh, types of uh, networks with pickups, uh, lots of distance between customers, and then having to do a final uh, drop off to the inner city region. So you can see this is quite um, messy in terms of distances traveled um, when we have independent um, operators with their own depots, with their own vehicles, uh, servicing the metropolitan area 
and then finally the inner city area. So uh, we introduced some new concepts which said, well, if we have a shared system, then um, customers in the vicinity of these depots uh, can be serviced by, by the same vehicle. And this vehicle can do a collection run and consolidation at depot level uh, for different operators. And these can be um, for shorter distances, uh, electric vans, bicycles, and, and smaller types of vehicles, uh, less distance traveled, and then a shuttle into the, um, into the central city areas where locker banks can be used to exchange goods, and then goods can be traveled by uh, sh shorter and, and more um, non-motorized transport with bicycles and walkers um, doing the, the bulk of these smaller routes um, because they've got high efficiency routes when they're servicing uh, different um, uh, customers uh, from different uh, um, distribution companies. So this sharing of customers, sharing of vehicles, sharing of depots introduces huge savings again in the distance traveled and the opportunity for uh, these low emission or zero emission vehicles to be utilised. And then in our large metropolitan areas, it's quite common for uh, manufacturing companies, production companies to have their own vehicles to deliver their own goods across town. And then they typically return back to the uh, warehouse or, or production facility empty. So a lot of cross town travel with the empty vehicles. And then it is possible to introduce a shuttle type service where a pickup and delivery option occurs at each, um, each of these areas. And, um, and then larger high capacity vehicles, which are more fully utilized, can operate shuttles between these specific areas. So again, the distance traveled and the savings in, in distance traveled by vehicles um, is, is dramatically reduced given to this increased consolidation with different vehicle movements um, and, uh, of course, lots of less transport costs, but also lots of less uh, emission-related impacts. Finally, looking at the, the freight areas within Melbourne, um, we have lots of different um, areas which have got large warehousing, large uh, manufacturing um, um, uh, activities and um, in the metropolitan area. So to extend this concept of this uh, shuttle, uh, we can have regular services traveling between these, uh, these areas in Melbourne um, to pick up and to transfer uh, goods between these, these areas. So we have large um, um, sort of industrial areas and these movements can operate the direct shuttles with the larger capacity vehicles uh, to minimize the empty running and to um, reduce the total number of vehicles required and the distance traveled. So this, uh, this um, uh, statistics show that um, uh, currently, um, and when we did our modeling, um, that um, we basically have uh, a, um, we have um, uh, with, uh, with the introduction of, of shuttle services, we go from 170 um, uh, thousand vehicle kilometers traveled down to about 30. So dramatic reduction by introducing a shared transfer type network within the metropolitan area. We of course get lots of, um, uh, lots of um, uh, savings in, in terms of, um, of costs uh, because of the distance savings. Uh, we, we have to pick up and the transfer routes you know, locally, but then we have these uh, transshipment routes and these shuttle routes between these key freight areas. And the efficiency of our network increases um, from 2.5 pallets per vehicle up into 17.2 with the larger vehicles, but certainly the larger utilization of those vehicles. And we did cost modeling too to show that um, this is very competitive in terms of the costs that could be charged um, for given these uh, vehicles that have got such a higher utilization. So this again illustrates that if we can design more shared, open and collaborative systems, then we can get dramatic reductions in the distance traveled by vehicles operating mainly in this case, urban areas to do with the transfers and the sharing of loads and vehicles. And so this is, provides a great opportunity for reducing emissions and, um, and therefore uh, reducing um, the environmental impacts, obviously health um, and environmental change impacts there. So um, this, uh, thank you for the opportunity and, um, uh, and I look forward to the, the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Russell. That's, that's an excellent presentation and I really enjoy that. I think it walks us through into really inspiring city network logistic system we will sooner touch upon I, I think i'm inspired by by your talk and come up with some spontaneous questions hopefully we can touch upon all of them sooner in our panel and i will just quickly move on to our next panelist uh professor Tsinghua Zhu from shanghai Jiaotong university the floor is yours Tsinghua. and um, yeah thank you Shenzhen. i will also share my screen
Sorry. Okay, it's here. You can see my screen now, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. It's it's great opportunity for me to share my uh, ideas about uh, green supply chain management and uh, carbon dioxide uh, carbon uh, emission reduction. Actually, I'm from uh, I'm from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Actually, I'm uh, I have been in the field of green supply chain management for over twenty years since nineteen ninety nine. So first, I will briefly introduce. Uh, green supply chain management. I presume most of you have heard about green supply chain management. Actually, the num uh, for the majority of research and also practices, green supply chain management focus on, focus on company level. It, it means that originally company really think about uh, internal, think about production. We call it internal environmental management. Then uh, in the later we realize if you supply, have some environmental issues, you will have, uh, you may, uh, it will affect your reputation. Even you will, uh, you will uh, face interruption due to supply uh, environmental issues. So now that uh, people think about green purchasing, later people think about, uh, you also need to think about to cooperate with your uh, consumers or customers, now extend to customers. So for green supply chain management, uh, we normally think about life cycle products, then integrate environmental concerns into your supply chain management. So that we have three typical green supply chain practices. Then later we, uh, we, uh, we understand that for the end of products, if we can, it, uh, for end of products, it produces many weights. If we can use such kind of end of products, Turn these resource, uh, turn these waste to resources. Then we can significantly induce waste, and also we can alleviate resource uh, resource lack like issues. So here we include uh, the four groups of planting practices. We call it investment recovery or reverse logistics or reverse supply chain management. In and we actually for everything, if we really can. I really can manage a product or manage a product along your supply chain. Eco design is the most important. It means that uh, well, due to design, it determines that uh, design can determine what type of materials, what type of components you use. And also design can determine if your products will consume a lot of electricity. And also eco uh, design can determine if your products can be easily disassembled after you uh, uh, after uh, you use, so we uh, include uh, the five uh, the fifth one. So at the company level, we usually think about the green supply chain management for internal environment management, green purchasing from supplier level, and customer cooperation from downstream level, and also think about the reverse logistics, and in the end for eco design. So here. If you read some uh, papers, for the majority of these papers, they are discussing at the company level. Actually, for it, uh, green supply chain management, uh, we also have discussed uh, at the supply chain level. If you uh, think about at the supply chain level, we also can think about at the policy level. We maybe we have different uh, perspectives. Normally, we think about uh, along the supply chain, along the li life cycle, which company have the um, maybe uh, as a, uh, which company has the most powerful or uh, or have strong effect along supply chain. So in this case, we need to think about how to define focal company, how to identify company along supply chain. In this case, we mean that if this company they are not a traditional polluting companies but they can affect their suppliers, they can affect their customers, then we call it these focal companies. Then for government, you need to think about how to motivate, how to manage these, uh, these suppliers, uh, these focal companies. They can affect their uh, suppliers and customers uh, more effectively. I use an example, actually, Walmart initiated its green supply chain management 
program in 2008. And we know Omat is not a traditional polluting company. Omat doesn't uh, consume a lot of electricity directly, but uh, the majority, more than 19, uh, 19%, uh, 92%, where well, solid waste or wastewater come from their suppliers. All that mentioned, oh, I need to bring uh, our supplier. If you couldn't meet the environmental requirement, the supplier couldn't sell their products in all that. It is more effective. So this way, for at the supply chain level, we try to identify for a company and motivate this company, require this company to create their supply chain. So here, uh, we always, uh, we, uh, we mentioned that for green supply chain management, it's good to think about at a company level, but it is more effective to think about at a supply chain level. So here, actually, for a government, they have some regulations which can, which really motivate the company to uh, to implement green supply chain management. There are two typical directives. One is a uh, rules restriction of hazardous substance. It was enacted on July the 1st, 2006. It, it means that if you sell, if one company wants to sell their products in European Union countries, or for example, in Germany, you need, uh, your product couldn't have any uh, substance. It means that you need to manage suppliers of your components. You need to manage suppliers of your materials. So here, extend your responsibility to uh, the suppliers, not only for the first tier, even uh, to the third or low tier suppliers. Another uh, directive, uh, we call it WEE, with the electrical and electronic equipment. It was enacted on August uh, 13, 2005. It means that for a producer, you need to be responsible for the, uh, for the cost of treatment for your end of life product. It means that you need to be responsible for your product, not only after sales, even after consumers do not need them, they, uh, these products become uh, become uh, end of life products. It may, so for producers, they need to think about the uh, eco design. They need to think about uh, if their products become end of life products, can these products be easily disassembled? Can these uh, end uh, weights uh, be turned to uh, turn to resources? So here. Uh, for these two directives, uh, all companies uh, have to think about, have to implement a green supply chain management. But uh, as double mentioned, there are many multinational enterprises. They, uh, they have facilities all over the world. Different countries have different uh, regulations. How to improve environmental performance along global supply chain? It's a big challenge for all multinational uh, enterprises. So in China, actually, we do not have, uh, we have some similar regulations, but uh, they, uh, we have some flexibility. But instead, we have some, uh, we, uh, we have uh, in direct countries, they use stick policy. In China, we uh, can call it, we have carrot uh, policy. Actually, in China, we have demonstration project. It means that if company really uh, demonstrates they can do something on green supply chain management, you can get a subsidy. You can uh, get uh, support from government. I have such kind of data actually in China from 2000 and 2016 to 2008. Our government uh, provide 2 billion RMB per year to support uh, about 100 companies to implement their green manufacturing uh, project and including green supply chain management. So here, Actually, for green supply chain management, uh, uh, it started uh, a long time ago, uh, from 1970s. Originally, we think about how to avoid the risks for suppliers. I just imagined maybe suppliers' environmental uh, practices may uh, affect your reputation, may even bring interruption. But now, we more think about uh, value creation. If you work with your suppliers, maybe additional value can be created. But for the next question is uh, how, uh, who should invest for such kind of efforts? Uh, how to assign such kind of additional value? So, so that's what we uh, discuss. Actually, there are a lot of research. And, uh, it is a map. We can see for the majority of countries, uh, they have scholars in the field. 
because I began to uh, study in this field a long time ago, I was uh, ranked as number two in this field. Actually, today we discussed the carbon emission. I think actually broadly speaking, carbon emission is part of uh, environmental issues. For in, uh, traditional environmental issues, we think about uh, solid waste, uh, waste water, or waste gas. Carbon emission, it, we, broadly speaking, we also can consider it as one of uh, environmental issues, but it is a common issue all over the world. So I, uh, based on my understanding, I think it's linked to IPCC scope three, we also need to think about the direct emission scope one, also think about the interaction, including heat, uh, electricity consumption, heat and cool consumption. And also for scope three, we need to think about uh, upstream and the downstream emission. So here, actually, I use an example, actually Apple commits to be 100% carbon neutral for its supply chain and products by 2030. Uh, they measured about it. Actually, why? Because they did some calculation uh, because mo the majority of emissions come from their suppliers, 76%. So that's a reason. And uh, what has been done? Actually, if you uh, check uh, Apple's website, they use all five uh, green supply chain practices to reduce their carbon emission at uh, scope three. They think about uh, how to make their products, uh, how about uh, packaging issues, how to recover end of life products, uh, and also of course, source materials. For the majority, they think about eco design, eco design then carbon uh, for iPhone, it's easy to be, it's assembled. It's easy to be used in the, uh, in, uh, in the future or be uh, in the next, uh, uh, next version of IP uh, phone. So here, uh, what has been done? Actually, uh, also there, uh, there is an example. I, my understanding that before 2011, Apple didn't care, my, uh, care anything or care much about green supply chain management, but uh, due to uh, requirements from non-government organization, do, uh, they began to think about how to optimize uh, life cycle of their products, not only from whole life cycle, also think about second life cycle of their end of life products. So they redevelop their marketing modes, they return products from consumers. They also develop robots to, to disassemble their products. So in the, during this way, they reduce in carbon emissions, they reduce weight significantly at the same time, they also get economic gains. So thank you. I also used up my time. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Tinghua, for this very interesting presentation. And I believe green supply chains management, that's that's a very important part of, of this panel. So thanks for bringing that topic. And thank you all for for your onboarding message and including our keynote, I, I think we can now um, turn turn on our cameras. And because I I, I think we we all can just wait to join and to, uh, to jump into this panel discussion session. And um, I'm sure it will be very interesting given the, the different aspects and different experts uh, expertise you have. Uh, so in the next hour or so, I will raise a few questions. And please do feel free, do feel free, each of you, to either click the raise my hand button uh, in this Zoom room, or indeed just raise your hand. So I will just pass the microphone to you. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Di Ting Sun from Matter, is very kind of helping us to take care of the questions from the audience. So, and all the audiences, please, please feel free to enter your question um, via our live stream interface. If we have time, we will put these to the panel members. So um, just, just a very, very, um, very, um, I, I would say, baby step start after these very interesting presentations. I guess we could start from something more basic. So we know that global trade, that touches upon a lot of things and supply chains that covers a lot of sectors and then logistics. And even for logistics, which seems to be the basic part of decolonizing 
or and transforming the transport and uh, trade and transport sector. It's also varies a lot domestically and internationally. And if we could start from domestically and using cities as a unit, because we all know that cities are quite important. It contributes about 70% to the global emissions and logistics share a big part of that. And as, as Russell addressed in his presentation, even at city level, the logistics, it, it covers a lot of different factors. Like uh, we need to consider efficiency, we need to consider cost, we need to consider capacity. And there are different considerations of like the storing capacity for different kinds of goods and the distance, the efficiency, a lot of things. Um, as we always say, we can't really put all eggs in one basket. But for this case, I, I guess we have to play around with different factors there. So before we jump into how we can address the challenges to decarbonize domestic logistics, I think it would be really interesting if we could unfold a little further regarding what are the key barriers that we're currently facing to to make the low carbon transition for domestic logistics, be it technology, be it um, socioeconomic um, barriers. Maybe, maybe Russell, you, you would like to share some insights given your expertise? Uh, thank you, yes. Look, um, I think that the, the barriers really, I think, are to do with um, trying to share data and, and to share resources. And obviously in a competitive environment that can introduce lots of sensitivities and lots of um, um, barriers to, to um, getting the coordination, the integration and uh, the sharing um, that's required to um, implement this, um, this sort of physical internet concept, which uh, I think is really appropriate. But, um, and so, yeah, there's lots of commercial barriers to do with uh, sharing and, and um, really, yeah, sort of, um, because uh, we need quite a lot of detail about the movements and the types of goods and the types of vehicles and the opportunities for for sharing and, and collaborating. And and um, so there there are lots of challenges with the sensitivity of the markets and the um, uh, the movements and everything uh, to, um, to, to actually get that degree of cooperation um, in a commercial and competitive um, sense. Thanks a lot, Russell. Um, Mike, would you like to add something? Okay, so uh, uh, for the logistics, so this is different from the manufacturing sector uh, because uh, in the logistics uh, activities, uh, this involves many intermediaries. It's not just a single firm can can do all the things. So you need to uh, uh, coordinate with the upstream shippers. So uh, what, what type of packaging materials they, they use and then how, how they arrange the, 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 the process. And also you also need to uh, coordinate with the downstream consignees. And, uh, and one more complicated issue is that uh, in the logistics industries, uh, uh, my, my study is mainly on the, uh, the, the big one, the list company. But in reality, in the logistics industry, so there are many small and medium sized companies. So they may be lacking the financial resources to, to, to invest in the so-called the optimization practices uh, to improve the, the routing, uh, improve the packaging. So they, they may be lacking the incentives to do so. And, uh, and, and, and also uh, for logistics, uh, I, I think uh, one, one concept is very important is about the engagement, is to engage uh, the other parties uh, uh, to, to do the same thing for the carbon emissions because uh, as unlike the manufacturing, uh, mainly by the multinational, they are, they are resourceful. But for the logistics, so uh, there are many, many intermediaries in the process. So uh, how, how to engage them uh, to participate, how to engage them to, to implement these similar practices, how to engage them for implementation of the uh, 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 improved operations and improved process uh, is, is, a, is the major challenges. And then we need to think about uh, the, the, the incentive issue and maybe also about the, uh, the, the uh, government support uh, to reach this goal. Uh, this is my uh, two cents. Thanks a lot, Mike. I think, I think that's, that's quite useful. And because as both you and Russell addressed, it's cooperation is very important and engagement is also very important. Maybe from the urban planners viewpoint, they could design better networks, et cetera. But the important thing is that they could leverage that 
based on a better network. So um, before I jump into the next question, Dabo or Tinghua, would you like to do, would you like to add anything to this discussion? Uh, Tinghua, you may you may go first. Yeah. Okay, I actually, I'm not an expert uh, in logistics, but uh, based on my observation, I, I think uh, uh, as uh, Mike mentioned, the coordination is very important. Coordination, uh, not only uh, maybe for logistic providers, they need, need to coordinate with manufacturers, also need to coordinate with, uh, with consumers. I have worked with uh, the uh, 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 logistic provider called Yuan Tong. Yeah, Yantu is one of big uh, the logistic provider. Actually, they noticed that they, they want to trans, uh, transport their uh, products, optimize their process, but uh, they do not uh, do not have power. How to uh, the manufacturer uh, made decision where and how to uh, sell, uh, how to uh, where to transport their products. And I use an example, uh, and also it uh, it is related to consumer. Uh, also, I uh, I know Yuan Tong developed a program uh, called it a packaging, return packaging. Packaging can be returned, can be reused for many times. But the problem is that uh, the, uh, the majority of packaging is not provided by Yuan Tong. When uh, online uh, shopping, the majority packaging is there already when Yuan Tong pick up their packaging. Not, so it's very, uh, and also another way for consumers, they uh, they need to persuade uh, consumer. Uh, consumer would like to use such kind of returnable packaging. So I I mean uh, I, 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 I uh, initial points from my observation. I think uh, for uh, not uh, if for uh, a logistic provider do by themselves, it's very difficult. They need to cooperate with manufacturer. They need to get strong support from consumers. Thanks a lot, Tinghua. Um, yeah, uh, just a simple uh, point to add. Um, there has been uh, lots of technologies uh, going on or, or like uh, retrofitted uh, at the regional or at, at the local on-site level. And the um, like, um, like automation, automation, and uh, like using robots or whatsoever to to speed up the the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, kind of the logistic uh, like optimization is is uh, is on site to so many places. Doesn't matter if it's in the U.S. or in China. We've seen so many uh, advanced technologies on that. Similarly, managing uh, like a green port or other kind of the technologies are have or is is increasingly uh, retrofitting in the uh, on-site level but uh, as many of uh, the panelists called, uh, said that is a lack of the coordination for the global uh, large kind of cross country or cross regional uh, coordinations or the organization uh, for that uh, part so i think that's is the some i think the research perspective will need to be um uh, kind of a strengthened uh, intercity or between cities and then how this is uh, logistics can be uh, efficient and also the green uh, way to do that yeah thanks a lot that boy yeah and also thanks Tinghua. i think those are really adding to uh, this this big bigger picture which, which is also referring, referring me back to Russell's uh, talk, talk about building this network of city logistics, which is extremely important as double adjust. More research needs to be done, not just for technology part, but also the operation and as you all addressed coordination and engagement. So um, may, maybe we could move, move make, make the talk a little bit broader. Uh, so, as we know that um, there are some opportunities for the domestic logistics. What about the international ones? We know that for domestic ones, they're, they're like the transport, the, the, even the trucks are a little difficult to decarbonize, but there are emerging technologies like fuel cells and like robustics that we just mentioned. Um, but for longer distance transportation, like shipping, especially aviation, it's, it's still um, worth, I think we're we're not yet there for the technology breakthroughs. So how what are the bigger barriers? What are the biggest barriers for international logistics 
except from the technology, just from the planning and yeah, governance aspects that that are currently um, hindering us moving towards a more uh, low carbon footprint future. Um, maybe I, I I go first mm -hmm. on this. Uh, I think the, uh, the the international logistics is a uh, big issues. I, I I'm not talking about aviation. Well, aviation has lots of issues, but let's uh, start a focus on one of the the blue water right now is which is a uh, uh, high sea basically um, emissions in high sea um, because high sea has no kind of um, uh, like. Um, it's not anybody's territory, and it's a public space. Uh, and uh, what's the practical way for most of vessels or the internet shipping uh, ships? What they do is that um, uh, they, because most of the the ports, global ports, they have a green standard. Uh, it was triggered by the air pollution issues. So it doesn't matter if it's in Shanghai or in New York, uh, before you park into the port, port then, then you, you need to reach a certain levels. So most of the uh, the, the vessels uh, for the international kind of ships, they have uh, two different engines. They burn two different fuels. So when they are about to park or, uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the harbor, uh, they start to when they enter to us uh, any countries uh, like uh, the water, they will switch to a, a like high, high less pollutant uh, fuels, and versus in the high sea, they will burn this um, uh, heavy oil basically uh, to be cheap to run it. It's simply it's cheap. <clears throat> then um, uh, you, you know the, the emissions in the high seas is uh, like three four times. Uh, than the when they park in when you burn the, the less efficient uh, more more efficient the fuels in the in the in the uh, in the harbor so uh, so uh, uh, and the most of the the vessels uh, they they produce the emissions is uh, uh, along the high seas and there's no ter no anyone's territory and uh, there's no responsibilities uh, it, <coughs> this is is especially along with the global warming, uh, we're gonna see the um, uh, Arctic uh, is gonna be become um, like uh, uh, suitable for, for shipping, so suitable for, for, for cruising or whatsoever. And then and more and more ships will, from uh, North America to Far East, uh, then they will be shipping from that side. And then from the North Pole perspective, uh, those vessels, heavy polluting the vessels become a big emission source, uh, not only for the carbon emissions, but also the pollutants, air pollutants, uh, and especially the black carbon that will become a very important uh, radiative um, kind of um, uh, the em em uh, kind of uh, emissions to, to actually the, if the, 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 those black carbons uh, landed in the, in the snow, they will actually absorb the radiation from the sun. They were accelerating this uh, melting process for the ice sheets or all the all the all in the northern pole area. Anyway, so so those is um, as a, a, a alarming kind of um, um, uh, issues, and then the the this is so this in the high sea is very important uh, for the global um, governance. It's, it's it's empty right now. And they need to be uh, strengthened or need to be uh, agreed on how you can operate or how become more green, greener, at least um, uh, low carbon in this uh, high sea uh, level. Yeah. Well, thanks, Dabo. That, that's really interesting and very timely topic. Do you know if there's any, like currently, any progress or any initiatives that are trying to make some global governance of this? Um, area that seems like everybody could touch upon but nobody is taking responsibility for so uh, for the for the sea transport so i i, I trust the international maritime organizations this, this is uh, one of the branch of the uh, united nations uh, they have a very uh, comprehensive governance for about the carbon emissions by by, by vessel about the, the type of fuel to, to 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 use in different countries and also about the balanced water for discharge uh, in the destination ports and etc 
So for international logistics, it is more complicated than the domestic one, particularly uh, it will involve more parties to coordinate. So for domestic one, it's, it's very simple. The most basic one is just a buyer and seller. Then uh, you, you, you buy something, then you pay the money, then you take the, the good by yourself. But in international logistics, it's not possible because at least you need to go through the, 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 the home port, the foreign port, and also even arriving the port, you also have the connecting flight, the road transportations. And then also there are many different uh, connecting parties, for example, the tempor temporary uh, warehousing storages, and also about the, uh, the, the truckers. So uh, the different parties may be doing uh, different things and having different parties, even though if one party, one single party have a very uh, uh, high uh, commitment on the uh, 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 decarbonizations, but the downstream parties or the upstream parties are not in alignment <laughs> with the parties, with, with the practice, then uh, the, 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 the efforts will be uh, uh, compromised. Uh, that's why uh, the panel has been uh, emphasizing about the need for coordinations in uh, decarbonization and in logistics uh, for uh, international operations it is more complicated particularly so there are different countries with different regulatory requirements some countries are stricter some countries are loser uh, uh, there's no uh, single mechanism to coordinate even though there's uh, even in the in the maritime and IMO they are they are standard but uh, some countries are, are, are loser in the enforcement. So uh, there's uh, 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 the, the issues and also the main challenges. So uh, 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 in my study, uh, 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 I study about the, uh, the logistics providers in China. So um, many of them are mainly, mainly doing about the baseline uh, due to about the need to comply with the regulatory uh, requirements. And uh, they may be lacking the incentive to do more because uh, if they do more, this means they will need to invest more money, but, but this may not bring more profit. Uh, this can be the issue. You need to have some more incentives. So uh, uh, what I, 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 I propose in my study is to have a green transition. It's just now, apparently they are doing the baseline, but in the next step, they may, they may need to identify some profitable practices. So uh, by profitable means that it may be some subsidies from government to make this practice more, profitable for them to uh, uh, undertake. And maybe in the higher level, they may also consider some alternative fuel or, or cleaner energies and et cetera. So this may be the transition, uh, the pathway uh, for the logistics industry. Uh, I, I will see that uh, this is very challenging for the logistics industry for decarbonization because of the uh, nature of the industry, uh, which uh, involve many different intermediary in the process. Uh, which are very difficult to coordinate. Uh, 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 these are my sharing. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mac. I, I think that's that's really insightful and very valuable um, points addressed there. Because as 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 we all know, that coordination it sounds very very easy and it sounds um, very well thinking, but in reality, in practice, is there are so many different things that are related and. And there, there could be trade-offs more than synergies. So how we could um, make a green transition as, as Mike addressed also in his um, panel presentation, step-by-step, step, but also make integrated efforts and make that efforts create co-benefits rather than cost more than the investment. I think that's that's really where we would like to go, and maybe that's also the next research frontier that we would like to, yeah, dig deep, dig deep deeper into that. So the, really, <laughs> the good news is that uh, so uh, we in, in this uh, decade we have seen more and more uh, innovative technologies, about the, particularly about the information technologies. Uh, this can also be applied to improve the coordinations. Uh, as our, our Professor Zhu has mentioned about the green supply chain management. So there can also be some types of a green supply chain innovations by the using about the digital technology to improve uh, the performance. Maybe our, our Professor Zhu can also share about uh, this idea. Sure, yeah, definitely. And thanks, thanks Mike for leading us to a, a very relevant um, topic, which is supply chains. I, I believe supply chains, what well, logistics are already very compli complicated, be it domestic or international, but supply chains, as, as we all know that it's, it, it 
takes in more factors, include more um, sectors and countries. Um, something that I'm I, I'm wondering if if um, it, it might be interesting to discuss here is that we all know that um, tariffs. I think that will address that in his uh, keynote talk, and Tsinghua mentioned something uh, in in her presentation. Tariffs like uh, carbon tax um, border at, at a border level have been considered as a very important measure to address body emission issues. And there are some uh, recent um, mechanisms uh, initiated in the EU at the EU level and uh, maybe some discussions also in China. So um, I'm just wondering, maybe, maybe it's too early for us to say it is effective or it is not work. But um, we're, from your ex, ex, expertise background, how do you see this kind of mechanism could work um, effectively to like facilitate coordination rather than making disruption and to foster a better and green and more inclusive supply chains? Maybe that would you would like to share some insights? Okay, um, the uh, the border tax uh, it's uh, it's actually um, starting to be a, a very hot topic. It seems to be a, a big debate during uh, when the European uh, Emission Trading System when they first launched. Uh, there was a big debate about whether there should be a emission trading carbon trade or carbon uh, carbon tax uh, in there. Uh, there was always been a, a discussion uh, which one will be more uh, effective on that way. <clears throat> so, um, so from the uh, the the embodied emissions uh, for the supply chain, certainly the border tax will be more um, uh, kind of effective in terms of addressing uh, the, the 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 amount or the volume and also the intensity of the embodied emissions. Um, uh, I think uh, the the border tax uh, will be work uh, well in the developing uh, developed countries, but for the global supply chains, I hold some uh, like uh, reservations for that. <clears throat> so, so the reason for that is what I've seen um, right now uh, in Europe, um, and then uh, like mostly in Europe. Uh, we have an emission trading uh, <coughs> uh, carbon trade system. Uh, they are using a border taxes mainly is to try to regulate or trying to tax on the emissions to uh, the imports to, from China, Vietnam, uh, India, most of the developing countries. The key uh, rationale behind is that uh, Europe has been pushing global carbon market, uh, has uh, faced some uh, uh, agree challenges, uh, mainly can't agree with the, the carbon price with uh, developing countries. Uh, so it's not very fair to charge about uh, 50 euros per ton or 70 euros per ton in Europe, uh, same price charge in China, the Indian, that's uh, very different in terms of the comparative uh, market price. Um, and uh, then uh, as a more creative way to do this uh, carbon marketing uh, should be uh, should, should should be established. And Europe um, in Europe in Europe it's this uh, this way doesn't really work and they started to think about how could bring the developing countries into the global carbon market by charging the border tax, which is they are they they could uh, they certainly have the comparative advantage in terms of um, in terms of um, the, uh, the 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 uh, like a level of the 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 tariff they can charge for. Uh, most of the developing countries would have a higher carbon intensity in terms of production products uh, on this. Um, so I think um, uh, it, it will be once this is, is gonna establish or, or implemented, will certainly will have uh, would have the um, uh, the immediate effects about the 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 uh, the, the global supply chain kind of uh, things. But I I would think uh, this wouldn't shouldn't be um, uh, within the Europe or even between Europe and the US. Um, uh, possibly between the uh, kind of um, um, all the developed uh, OECD countries, 
uh, that would be fine because uh, it's uh, each every kind every firms uh, they are on similar technology levels and uh, they could be afford of that uh, potentially. Um, but uh, applying uh, to these uh, develop developing countries so like the lag behind uh, countries that would make um, uh, the global supply chain will be disturbed quite destructive and uh, and then I think that would force um, most of the the, the products uh, would uh, go to uh, many of the products uh, from the, from China India will consume between the global south uh, countries, we have seen this um, uh, the trends that um, the uh, the growth of uh, global products or commodities are quickly consumed by global South countries, and uh, yeah, so the the volume is still China EU China US is still biggest, but the the, the increase uh, has always been in the global South country themselves. Um, so uh, so this is would uh, actually push. Unless this is a global um, uh, mechanisms, and then it will further push the carbon leakage, uh, not only production leakage, but this time will be a consumption leakage to to other developing countries. Um, so, so, um, uh, so I think it's a is a in theory is a good mechanisms depending on how they could. Uh, be implemented more effectively. I, I would think, um, as I in the presentation, I would say um, to have 190 countries or 130 countries agree on Paris Agreement uh, will be, uh, it's good, but it's less effective. Uh, less effective than uh, I know in the Paris, in the Glasgow last time, uh, there was a global business leaders, business leaders talking about like the top hundred um, uh, companies, if they, their CEOs or, or their, their 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 stakeholders can agree that uh, they want to do something uh, co cooperatively, uh, you know, to to push the global supply chain, they are all the lo uh, global leading business, and it will be much more effective than the government actions. Thanks a lot, Dabo. That that's that's really insightful comments there, and. Yeah, I think there are a lot to take from there. Um, given that the time is running, I'm, I'm going to jump directly into the next question, but uh, we're very welcome for audiences to discuss further about um, this border tax mechanism and how at a global level we can do a better um, decarbonization of the supply chain via different measures and do it in, the, in a more fair way. So by far, I think we have talking about one side of the uh, logistics impacts on climate change, like during the via emissions and etc. But at the same time, we know that um, either logistics or our supply chains they are they are quite uh, they they could be quite influenced by climate change itself as well, like extreme weather events that could easily disrupt the infrastructures for transportation etc. So. Um, I am just quite interested in hearing, perhaps, Russell, you have more expertise from this, this aspect. How, how, what, what are the possible ways and what are the very effective ways that we could um, design cities, which on the one side, it allows low carbon trans, uh, logistics and at the same time, it's also facilitated resilient logistic networks. Thank you. Yes, look, um, the physical internet itself is, we've done research recently, which shows that it's far more resilient because of its distributed nature, shared nature, it's flexible, it's adjustable, and um, and it's quite dynamic in the way that it allocates these um, resources and, and it designs these networks. So it's far more responsive and and that in, in compared to independent networks where operators are operating their own fleets, their own facilities, and are only interested in their own supply chains, we're finding the physical internet is a far more resilient and, and, and robust um, uh, uh, types of networks can be created. And we've actually uh, done a lot, a lot of research. So in terms of natural disasters and climate change impacts, um, the, the physical internet is a really uh, very good way for, for us to be able to cope with this, with 
distributed networks with shared uh, facilities that can be adjusted very quickly uh, for, um, for the transition to, to, if there are facilities, it's not going to be devastating. If there's goods moving and shared and, and collaborative storage and, and transport, uh, this it creates a very flexible dynamic and, and responsive. So um, the research we've done, even with global supply chains, is that this is a very, very um, good way of, um, of, of coping with all this uncertainty, all this disruption. And, um, and um, so I, I, I sort of think that um, we will move to that because uh, things are really changing. The, the impacts are quite um, uncertain, but they're getting more prevalent and, 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 and realizing at all different stages. And so having a more distributed and shared and collaborative is a really a great way to, to be able to cope with, the, with this type of, um, of trend. Well, thanks, Russell. I think it's, again, first of all, that's really interesting and very inspiring to hear that. And it highlights, again, the importance of collaboration and coordination and, of course, building um, stronger and more resi resilient networks via um, infrastructure and a lot of other urban plannings. So um, I wish we could have more time to continue this very interesting discussion, but I, I'm afraid we're moving very fast to, to the end. So before I end, um, we end this panel discussion, and although I think most of you have already shared um, some insights regarding future research priorities, I would like just to hear from you in a, in a very key um, takeaway manner. What do you feel would be the future research priorities in the context of today's um, panel discussion? Feel free to jump in, please. Uh, um, I, I think, uh, okay. yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I just offer two, two, two uh, keywords. Uh, one is about the engagement, is to engage the, the, the related parties uh, in the uh, decarbonization process, uh, process. It's not just about the engagement of the, of the, of the uh, related parties. They also, also need to engage them to have the related technology engage them to the uh, process improvement uh, to uh, improve the uh, 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 coordinations. Another keyword is about the transitions. So the, the decarbonization is not just a slogan. Uh, it cannot be immediate. So we really need to do it step by step, I, I, I trust. And, 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 and from my study, so uh, many of the uh, logistics service providers are mainly on the foundations level, very basic. So uh, maybe in the next step, uh, we need to provide them with some uh, profitable practices, perhaps uh, with some incentives, subsidies, and then we, we, when they find them are uh, profitable and also good for their profit and, uh, uh, and for the operations, uh, they will uh, invest further, for example, in the kinetic technology or alternative fuels or, 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 or better technologies. So uh, these are my, my, my keywords, the engagement and also the transitions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. Yeah, I think uh, we have addressed uh, quite uh, different um, uh, aspects uh, from this uh, trade and fright and, and the climate change, um, uh, you know, from different panelists. I myself learned quite a lot. <laughs> and I think this is strengthened uh, that we um, we need to um, to work together. And I think uh, from a research perspective, there's a lot of uh, gaps we could uh, uh, identify and also work. Uh, I, I can see there's expertise from uh, the logistic uh, uh, modeling, and then you know, and then myself is from uh, from 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 uh, the macroeconomic perspective. Professor Zhu was from the green supply chain management perspective. This is a lot of the uh, the 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 area. I think I mean uh, the uh, Shan Shan yourself, and also together with. Uh, uh, one of uh, uh, Cell Press colleagues is, has been doing a wonderful job to uh, put together on the, the panel. We can address the street and the climate uh, issues all together in you know, one, one shop kind of go, basically. Um, <clears throat> I think the a key message I try I, I, from my side is that um, firms or the companies, they are uh, the active players uh, and then they are the beneficiaries for global trade. Uh, well, many of the consumers as well, but the firms are making profits off for that. And they should play more role. And uh, they are happy to pay, play more role. 
um, several of the colleagues has already addressed, it doesn't matter as uh, Apple or others, they all have the carbon neutrality goals. Uh, and then they, this shows their willingness to play uh, their role in this. But uh, unfortunately, uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, the climate change has been um, been dominating the, by the government. It become more like uh, many people would say it's become a political kind of political kind of uh, um, things, but actually is a practical uh, thing to to do. And we have a, a, a actual goal, like a sol sol solid, solid target needs to achieve. And those cannot be addressed in the parliament, in the uh, or Congress or whatever. In in the in any, it has to be uh, physically, uh, practically addressed at the individual plant level on the firm level. And therefore, the business uh, they 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 need to play more roles in their daily operations, in their uh, like a, st a company strategies. And uh, anyway, uh, and then in the uh, the multinational enterprises uh, leadership strategies, so they need to address this uh, uh, comprehensively and uh, collective, uh, like a, a cooperation way um, with with uh, their friends, their 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 trading partners, and together, uh, you know, with the government and the consumer. Uh, stakeholders. So I think that's just the the key message I'm I'm, I'm teasing out from today's uh, uh, talks. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dabo. That's all well taken, and thanks for the sharing of those insights. Next, maybe Tinghua Russell, Russell um, whoever ready. Okay, I can say something, Russia. For uh, actually, for the first one, I think from coordination to collaboration. Actually, I think for the, from supply chain perspectives, maybe suppliers efforts, they need to invest, but benefit are for customers. For, for example, for uh, IPCC scope two, uh, carbon emission comes from, majority comes from uh, consumption of electricity, heat and cool. If equipment can uh, be better designed, then, a uh, customer can consume uh, can produce uh, can consume much less electricity but in this case equipment uh, equipment suppliers need to invest but the customer can benefit so in this case not only uh, coordination also need to think about uh, co uh, collaboration it is my first message the second one is about i think uh, from measurement to management for measurement actually we need to measure, we need to have some data, we need a scientific measurement tool, how to measure life cycle carbon emission. In this case, then we can develop some management tools. Maybe uh, we can see what type of operations management that company really can do. So we need a scientific, a scientific uh, measurement tool. We need the, the data collection, data availability. Then we need management uh, practices. It's my second message. The third message, uh, I think uh, maybe uh, we have different uh, policy, different regulations, uh, uh, and from different countries, we have different scenarios. Maybe we can do some simulations. Based on what we have done, for measurement, for management, then we can do simula uh, simulation uh, under, under such a, a certain scenario, we have to use such kind of policy, but in the future, we can adjust our policy. So I think uh, we can do some simulation. That's uh, my point. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tinghua. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting and excellent points. Thank you. And Russell? Please. Yes, look, um, I think uh, some of the research directions that I think are really important for um, facilitating this uh, collaboration, this uh, integration, exchange and sharing of resources is really more IT based tools, which um, and, and new entities for for coordinating all this exchange of data and information uh, in a dynamic sense in terms of being able to connect and being able to to, um, to really undertake transactions to be able to facilitate exchange, uh, to be able to sort of match uh, supply and demand in a dynamic sense uh, to do with um, looking for those opportunities. And we're starting to see lots of this uh, happening, but uh, we need to see this in a more integrated way. 
um, and um, and as I said, the bidding and pricing and, and the utilization of existing capacity can be far more utilized and um, and they will get far more, I think, uh, greater uh, environmental uh, orientated benefits. Thank you so much, Russell, for this very nice um, closing talk. So uh, logistics, supply chains and trade, as we learn from today's um, panel discussion is so deeply rooted in our everyday life and changing and also challenging to be de decolonized because they are attached to so many aspects and a slight change in one part could easily affect the situation as a whole. But we know where we could start better collaboration, coordination, governance, and a better network. Um, we cannot afford to sit still and just wait the magic to happen. But today we touch upon several possible roads where we can go further. As I said, um, I wish we could have more time to continue this very interesting discussion, but um, unfortunately, time is against us. I just would like to thank you all, Da Bo, uh, Tinghua, Mike, and Russell, for joining us today and sharing your insights, having this very interesting discussion, Da Bo, I especially appreciate your joining us from a very tricky time zone. And um, thank you all, the audience, for your attending. And uh, sooner we will have our next panel discussion, which, which is about uh, nature-based solution in about one and a half hour. But, before we see each other again, I just would like to say farewell to, to my panelists. Thank you all. Take care and hope, hope, hope to have the collaboration with you in the future. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ron.